While you're on your feet, we're going to go straight to the scripture. Uh, John chapter 1, starting at verse 14, and then going through verse uh, 18. I, I believe I gave our media team to verse 17, but I'm going to read verse 18 as well. Uh, we are in a series in this Christmas season uh, called He Came to Us. Our theme throughout 2023 was Come to Me, which was Jesus' invitation to us, Come to Me. But we're celebrating this Christmas season. He makes that an easy route because he came to us. How many of us glad that he came to us, right? And so now as we look at John chapter 1, we've been spending the last few weeks in these verses, and we're going to continue. We've talked about the light of Christ, the right of Christ. This week we'll be talking about the grace of Christ. John chapter 1, starting at verse 14, going through verse 18. We know participation is better than what? Let us read the word of God together. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. I want to look at verse 16 for emphasis. It says, for from his fullness, we have all, everybody say all. All, all receive, what, what did it say? Grace upon grace grace. This means heap after heap, wave after wave. So look at your neighbor and ask them the question, do you know what amazing grace is? Amen. That's my title, top of subject and focus, amazing grace. You may be seated, amazing grace. Today we'll see the availability, abundance, and assistance of grace. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this time. Here together, we thank you for your word that is alive, that is true, um, that purifies us from the inside out. I pray now, Lord, today that you will meet us, that you would do something in us that goes beyond our wildest imagination. Father, where we need to be transformed, transform us. Where we need to be encouraged, encourage us. Where we need to be saved, save us. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I know many of us know that hymn, and we could talk about the story of that hymn another day, but I believe that hymn captured a universal truth that is found in Scripture, that when you speak of grace, it is nothing short of amazing. As we look at John chapter 1, verse 14, I think that there is something that's worth exploring today that will help us in our eternal hope and our right now living. Because we need both. Because the scripture is not here just to make your week better, to make your Christmas better. The word is here to help us have an eternal hope. And then that eternal hope changes how we live right now. John 1.14, as we've been emphasizing it and focusing on it, it says, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son, the Father, Full of what? Grace and truth. That scripture is one of those that you can keep on reading, and it keeps on getting new. It keeps on getting deeper. It keeps on getting revelatory. That the word became flesh. I love Eugene Peterson's uh, take on this in the message version. It says, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Moved into the neighborhood. What a beautiful uh, imagery there, and you can catch the, gentle, the gentleness and the nearness of God moving into the neighborhood. Well, could you imagine in your neighborhood, whether it's an apartment building or a townhouse, you see some people unloading some stuff, 
and you look, and Jesus just waves at you. Hey, <laughs> could you imagine? I'm not, and some of y'all, if you live near Robert Trudy, he's not Jesus. He looks like him. <laughs> I'm sure Rob can bear the cross. Uh, let me keep going. But, but this idea that he moved into the neighborhood. The New Living Translation said, so the word became human and made his home among us, and he was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. That the Gospel of John, as we look at this, it, is the, it, this, it doesn't cover a Christmas story. The Gospel of John does not have a Christmas story. Luke has one. Matthew has one. Mark was in too much of a hurry to write one. <laughs> if you know anything about the Bible, everybody in Mark was on the way. They was always running with haste. And Matthew and Luke, they, Luke was a physician, and he cared about all the details. And Matthew wanted to make sure he got them all. And John didn't cover the Christmas story. But what he did cover was the incarnation. And we have to understand the revelation in the incarnation. Incarnation is basically what John 1.14 is talking about. God became man and wrapped himself in flesh and dwelt among us. He came into the world to make his home with us for a matter of time that he might save us. And when we get through John chapter 1 and we see in the beginning, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. And we get this idea that God and that the Word was God and the Word has been there since the beginning. And the Word didn't just want to oversee creation. The Word wanted to dwell with creation. That's good news, family. That he didn't want to just keep on sitting up high, looking down low, but he decided to move into the neighborhood with us. He came when you were least prepared. He came when you might have been in your biggest struggle. He came when you were lost and could not be found. He came when you needed something that the law could not provide for you. And I love how it says it in John 1, and we see this, and this is a sermon for another day, but it reveals to us the divinity of Jesus. It, it reveals to us the dwelling of Jesus, but it also reveals to us how he dealt with us. You got to remember that Jesus was not created. He created and so it was an interesting thing for a creator to now come through creation, which made him 100% God and 100% man. And theologians would say this is the hypostatic union. Jesus is the only one to, able to, pull, to be able to pull this off. And so we see the divinity that he was not created. He is creator. But they had decided to tabernacle with us. When we read that word dwell, that also means tabernacle. That means set up a place of meeting. When you read in, in the Old Testament and God gave instructions to Moses and the Israelites to set up a tabernacle, a place of meeting. And when Jesus came, he decided to tabernacle among us so that he can meet with us. But specifically today's focus is how he deals with us. How he deals. Has anybody ever dealt with you shysty? I know I'm in my clerical vestments today, but I still got some hood on me. Has anybody ever dealt with you sideways? They said what they said, but how they said it didn't feel right. You know how people deal. You know, sometimes people try to finesse you. They say nice words, but they're really cutting you underneath. Oh, it's how people deal with you. Some, some of us don't like to deal with a lot of folks to this day because you don't trust how they're going to deal with you. Oh, I'm telling you, you can see some saints lose their religion in the restaurant. Uh-huh. They done messed around and brought out the wrong thing. You done forgot you spoke in tongues and read your Bible. You said, no. I didn't ask for it to be well done. I need mine to have the blood of Jesus coming out of it. Rare. <laughs> How we deal. So, so I, I love in, in John 1.14, catch this, family. God wanted to reveal himself to all of humanity, to all of creation. And when he did it, he chose to have two things that we would know him by, grace and truth. God is revealing to us what Moses could not handle in Exodus chapter 33. And so when we read John 1, 14, and it says that and as he became, he, he became flesh. And he says, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father. And it says full 
of grace and truth. Now, catch this, family. A lot of people only seek God because they want his power to heal, his power to provide, his power to deliver, his power, his power, his prosperity. And a lot of people only want what they can get from God based on how they interpret what they need from God because of the secular version of what God's supposed to do. Now, I got a revelation for you. Everything I named, the power to heal, set, set free, deliver, save, the power to reconcile, the power to restore, let me tell you where it comes from. Grace and truth. Now, we'll cover, we'll cover truth next week. So, if you ain't here next week, that's on you. You can watch it. But this week, I'm going to look at this idea of grace. And because when you look at grace, grace is when we get what we can never earn and what we can never deserve. And in the power, when you think about it, you need healing, you need saving, you need deliverance, you need provision. I got, I got news for you. You don't deserve it. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory. The wages of sin is what? Death. I'm going to tell you what you deserve. A horrible eternal damnation. But that's not what he came with. It didn't say he came with judgment. He came with grace. Because while the wages of sin is death, the gift of God is what? Eternal life. This is good news, family. You got you to read this like you're drowning in a pool. And the life preserver comes out, grace and truth. I got myself in the situation. I jumped into the deep end knowing I couldn't swim. But it looked fun and felt good. But now I need your help. And he came with grace and truth. And when we look at grace, I love when you break it down as an acronym, G-R-A-C-E, God's riches at Christ's expense. He came to give you what you can never earn or deserve. And this, when I look at this, it's hard because when you look at the word grace and you define it from the Greek, uh, it says unmerited favor. All we see is grace. Unmerited favor, which you cannot earn it, and it's going to be above what you ever could produce yourself. Y'all hear? You cannot earn it, and it's going to be above what you can ever produce for yourself. But isn't it interesting that we see grace as one word, but in order to define it, we have to use unmerited favor. Favor in itself means you can't get it. So you're adding an adjective to an adjective, and what it is, you're compounding something that lets you know grace upon grace. I'm telling you, it's beyond your imagination. And so when I look at this, I think it's safe to say that this grace that manifested itself is simply amazing. <laughs> this amazing grace, uh, because God wrapped himself in flesh and dwelt among us, uh, this is what I call the availability of grace. Everybody say it's available. It's available. It's available. It's available. It's available. It's not sold out. It's not out of stock. Some of us have seen that on the stuff you want to order online. Out of stock, not at your location. I'm telling you, one of the worst things to do is be shopping on Target and you see what you want. Come on, am I in the building? We got me. Oh, my, my, I say Target. I'm sorry, Tabitha. I meant Target. <laughs> I'm sorry, Target. And you see it, and then they say, not in your location. Oh, let me talk about myself. I could be shopping on Costco. <laughs> Y'all know. Y'all know me. I should get stock. But then it has this thing, not available in your warehouse. Yeah, yeah. Now, either I got to drive or get it shipped, which means there's going to be a time lapse between when I get it and when I wanted it. Yeah, that's good. But when, 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 when God wrapped himself in flesh, <laughs> when he decided to move into the neighborhood, what he said is, it's available right now. Yeah. It's available when you need it. It's available. It's easy access to it. What I love about God's grace, what I love about the incarnation is that it lets me know that all that God has for me, it is available. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Titus 2, 11 says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It just popped out. 
That's what it says it appeared. You don't believe me? When you look at it, get in the Greek a little bit more, and you see the word appear, it means epiphano, which where we get our word epiphany, which means it's like, poof, there it is. You couldn't conjure it up. It just showed up. Y'all don't believe me? Let me tell you the Christmas story that John didn't want to tell you. There were some shepherds in the middle of the field, and while they was in the middle of the field, a, a worship leader angel decided to come out and say, hey, I got good news for you. That Today in the city of David, a Savior is born. Then they brought the whole choir, and they all were singing. Them shepherds did not plan on getting this moment, but right then grace said, bow, and just popped up. Has anybody ever had grace? Just have an epiphany moment right when you needed it, right when it was getting dark, and it just showed up for you. Family, that's what we celebrate in Christmas. We celebrate that he appeared to us. A sudden revelation of God showed up to us. And so when people say Merry Christmas, I'm going to tell you what they're really saying biblically, uh, what they should be saying biblically. Merry Christmas, grace is available. Season's greetings, grace is here. Holiday cheer, grace is here. Uh, here's, what, here here's what we've got to realize, that wherever you are, grace has already gone before you. And when you think about the availability of grace, I can't help but think about Psalm 23, and this is what David was talking about when he says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. What he was saying is that grace will be with me. That grace shows up, family. Anybody glad about that today? That grace shows up. Now, that might just be philosophical for you right now. I'm going to get a little bit more practical here in just a moment, but I, got you. I want you to understand the, uh, the abundance, the abundance of grace. Uh, I, I know we just came through Thanksgiving and we're looking forward to Christmas. And have you ever been full? I'm talking about so full that you feel like they got to roll you out. I mean, so full that you think you you think you're showing it, but you're really not. Well, maybe you were before. That's up to you. But you ever been so full you just feel like you couldn't function until. Oh, your body processed it. That's a, that's a cultural way to say it. So your body processed it, which means something had to be released. All right, amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, now, now when, when we get to this, though, uh, this, this, the, the idea of being so full uh, that you gotta, that you got to let something out. You could be full emotionally. I don't know if you've been so full emotionally you couldn't hold it in. Like when they was up here prophesying and praying over people, and I, I just got so full. And um, my allergies started acting up. <laughs> and so the tears started flowing. Uh, you could be full. Uh, the, thing, the thing is, uh, you're never full just for you to keep it. You fill up your gas tank so that it can take you somewhere. When you're full, it's meant to be used uh, for energy. And for advancement. Now, the, the language given in John 1.14, it says that he was full of grace. And if he didn't get it, verse 16, it said, and again, in verse 16, it says now, it says not only was he full of grace, it says, but then his fullness, from his fullness we receive grace upon grace. He was full of grace, and from his fullness we now receive something. When you are confident that there's no ending to what you're receiving, you don't live in scarcity. You got to understand the abundance, the abundance of grace. Sometimes, now, if you want my grace, um, you're going to be a day late and a dollar short. I don't have grace for all things, right? But God's grace is grace what? Upon grace. And when I look at this, because we got to understand grace upon grace, why would he come with that much grace? Like, why would, it, why would he need to be full of that much grace? It's a question that I have to wrestle with. Because we were full of so much sin. So he had to come with more grace than we had mess. So every time we needed grace, his unending supply can continue to go. Romans 5, 20 through 21 says like this. Now the law came in to increase this trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that sin 
reign in death, but grace also might reign through righteousness leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Hear the word eternity in the right now implications and the forever implications. He had to have grace. So where sin abound, grace had to abound more, right? And so when you get this thing, uh, what you're going to recognize is we look at John 1.17. John 1.17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now here's the thing. The law only pointed out your sin. Y'all got it. But the law did not remove your sin. Okay, y'all almost got it. Uncle Eric, the law told you about your sin, but grace deals with your sin. See, that's what, family, you got to get that. The law told you you fell short, but grace said you can get up. Oh, my gosh. The law told you you messed up, but grace said he got you covered. And it says, as sin abound, grace abounded even the more. Now, I want to help you. James chapter 4, verses 6 through 8. And this is what he says. But he, Jesus, gives more grace. Somebody shout, more more grace. He gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now, when you get this idea, he gives more grace. Family, I like that. That just blessed me right there. He gives more grace. Every time an issue arises, more grace. Every time a situation come up, more grace. Every time your addiction try to come back, more grace. Every time your old sinful habits come back, more grace. He gives you more grace. Grace. Anybody glad to get more, more grace? Grace upon grace. And he doesn't do it just so you can keep on sinning. Grace transforms whatever it touches. So this is why he had to come in and dwell in the neighborhood. Because it wasn't enough for him just to leave it on the porch. So he had to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dwell with you. And so as you receive him, this grace transforms you. Uh, Here's my last point, and then you can go to your holiday brunch, whatever you're doing today, praise God. That not only is this grace, this amazing grace available, not only is it abundant, uh, but then we see this grace is assisting. It assists us. It's assistance grace. Assistance means to give help. Assistance means to uphold. And, And when I look at that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Uh, the law was given through Moses. The, the law didn't assist us to the place of transformation. Now, there are several layers of grace. When we see the word grace, this is one of those, um, what are you, oh, is it, uh, what's the little dolls called? You open one, there's another one on the inside. Uh, uh, nestic, nestic, Russian dolls, nestic dolls. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Y'all so smart. <laughs> and so it's like, you open it up, and there's another one in there. There's another one in there. There's another one in there. It's kind of like when you look at the clown car, and people just keep on getting out. <laughs> Sometimes I, that's how I feel when we pull up somewhere. I'm like, still more people. <laughs> still, they still getting out. <laughs> and so we got to look. Grace is like that because when you define it, when you look at it, it keeps on revealing stuff. It keeps on giving you more and more and more. So when we say grace, you've got to understand there's, there's saving grace. Saving grace uh, is, is, is saves you. We are saved by grace, Ephesians 2 8 says. But then you got justifying grace. Justifying uh, grace, uh, you have been saved by grace, but justifying grace says now whatever you did before this grace touched you is erased. Y'all should be glad about that. Y'all, y'all act like y'all ain't got a record. <laughs> Do I need to get the media team to put your, to put your, yeah, okay, there you go. I figured when you say, oh, oh, you mean that stuff too? Yes, that, that, that stuff you trying to forget about. Hope don't nobody find out. He's like, you know what? I cast as far as it is from the east to the west. You better be glad. Your, your record is sponged by grace. Shoot, y'all better get right. <laughs> And then, but then you got the teaching grace, and in and, and Titus 2, it says that grace, remember, it transforms what it touches. Uh, grace teaches us to say no to worldliness. We need help with it. We need help to say no to worldliness. 
<laughs> y'all, y'all, I'm telling you, as I come to this Christmas season, I'm, I'm glad that he didn't give me what I wanted all the time. Come on. Come on. Y'all, yeah, man, y'all trying to act holy because Pastor Jim and Pastor David here. I got it. I, I understand. I understand. But, but you think about some of the stuff that you wanted yeah, yeah. That, that, that was not godly at all. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I'm glad he didn't give me some of the stuff I wanted. <laughs> Titus 2.12 shows us how grace assists us to live like we've encountered Jesus. It teaches you to say no. You got to learn to say no to sin. You got to learn to say no to these, to these temptations. Am I right? You got to learn. I need some help because if I see it, if it look good, tastes good, feel good, I want it. I can't help it. I'm born into sin. But when grace moves into the neighborhood, when grace comes in, it tells me you got an eternal hope and don't you squander it on a right now pleasure. I need grace to teach me to act right. I ain't got it in my willpower. It was up to me. You didn't got slapped. If it was up to me, I'd have ran over you. If it was up to me, I'd have stole your money. If it was up to me, I'd have ate everything I wanted to eat. If it was up to me, I am a sinner. But grace teaches me. Grace teaches me to say, no, I need this grace to help me. Uh, sometimes we're looking for people to help us. I'm telling you, grace comes in to help us. And, and here's what I like about this. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9, gives us the greatest picture of assistant, of assisting grace. When Paul had a thorn in his side and he was trying to get it out, he's prayed, God, remove this thorn. Some people say this thorn was an ailment. Some people say this thorn was torment. Some people say this thorn was a situation thing that he was going through. But whatever it was, this is what the Lord said to Paul after Paul the Apostle Paul who wrote 13 letters of the New Testament. This is what the Lord said to him. He says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And my power is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I would not boast and I would not, I will boast in my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. And so what Paul wanted, Paul wanted relief. But what God gave him was revelation. No, what he gave him was, I got you. He said, I got you, son. He says, every time you're weakened, I got you. And in your weakness, my strength is made perfect. Uh, family, this is the amazing grace that the hymn talked about. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind but now I see. Does anybody know about this amazing grace that when you couldn't help yourself God decided to help you. I'm so glad that there's grace that helps me live right. There's grace that helps me think right. There's grace that invites me when I am weak, when I am lost, when I I am depressed when I am worried. Grace comes in. Maybe y'all testimony ain't strong enough, so I called up my man. He really doesn't have a name. We just call him the prodigal son. And he went on about his own business, squandering his inheritance. But then he experienced amazing grace when he decided to come back home and try to act like a slave. But his father came and met him and called him a son and killed the fatted calf. That's amazing grace. Amazing grace. The woman who was caught in adultery, yes, she did wrong. Yes, she was caught in the act. There was no justifying it. Yes, she did break the law. But at the feet of Jesus, what she experienced was amazing grace. Oh, let me tell you about my man Peter. He was a cursor. He would cut people's ears off. But here's the thing. He denied Jesus three times. But when Jesus showed up back to him, it was amazing grace that Jesus gave Peter. And he restored him to ministry. And that's not the only one. That there was this third person on the cross. And with Jesus and two, it was Jesus and two thieves. And there was this thief that says, remember me on the day when you reached paradise. It was amazing grace that came out and touched that thief. Family, I just want to tell you Merry Christmas th this morning. I want to tell you season greetings this morning. I want to tell you happy holidays this morning. But what I'm really saying is that amazing grace is available. That amazing grace is abundant. That amazing grace is assisting. And because he's so full of grace, when they put him in that empty tomb, he filled up that grace. He filled up that tomb so much with grace that the stone had to roll away and three days later after he lay buried in that grave let me tell you what got up grace upon grace grace upon grace
grace. Is anybody glad about it today, family? That there's grace available for us today, family. That there's grace available for you. There's grace in the midst of your weaknesses. Hallelujah. Zechariah 4, 6, and you can go ahead and stand to your feet, family. We're going to leave on this one. Zechariah 4, 6, it says, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, a lot of us know that, but watch what he tells them to say. When he looks at this great mountain, this trial, this tribulation, he says, Who are you, great, oh great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid the shouts. Grace, grace. What God instructed him to do was to look at his mountain and make a pronouncement. Grace, grace. Our family, you're going to get your authority here right now that the next time you get into a trial, a tribulation, or a circumstance, I dare you to look at it and say, grace, grace. Next time your family start tripping, I dare you to walk up in the house and say, grace, grace. Next time your money looking funny and you don't know how it's going to happen, I dare you to look at your situation and say, grace, grace. Now, I don't know what you're going through. I don't know what you're facing, but I dare you to shout with me, grace, grace. Telling you this is what's gonna change you in the new year. What is it? Grace, grace. Look at your children. Don't worry about what the world is doing. Just speak it over them. Grace, grace. I'm telling you, you want your marriage to turn around. Look at your marriage and say what? Family, that grace. It is here. It is available, and that's your proclamation because as we saw early in John 1, you have received the right to become a child of God as you believed in him. Grace, grace. Father, we thank you so much for who you are. We thank you for this amazing, available, abundant, and assisting grace. We thank you that this grace is with us, that we cannot deserve it, we cannot earn it, but you have made it available for us. So, Father, I pray now, Lord, that in this moment, that we will receive this grace, the grace that teaches us to say no, the grace that teaches us to live right, the grace that teaches us to talk right, the grace that reminds us that we have an eternal hope. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was blind, but now I see. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. In Jesus' name, amen.